Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the 10th edition of the UTD Alumni Relations webinar series, UTD in Conversation. My name is Louise Delahunty, and I'm fundraising manager with UTD Foundation. We are delighted to welcome our UCD alumni community from around the world to listen as fellow alumni and UCD academics share their stories and ideas. This evening's session is titled COVID-19, Youth Mental Health and Wellbeing in a Crisis, a Practical Discussion. The timing of this conversation could not be more relevant as COVID-19 is still having a serious impact on our lives. The university has a duty of care to protect the mental health of our students. Unfortunately, there will be a significant increase in emotional distress as a result of COVID-19, and we must be prepared for this need. When vulnerable students may be suffering from extreme psychological stress, financial hardship, or managing ongoing conditions. Now, more than ever, we are more dependent on the generosity of our alumni due to the economic devastation of the COVID-19 pandemic. Thanks to the power of giving, our COVID-19 emergency appeal has raised more than 300,000 euro with supporting student mental health being one of our key objectives. UCD Foundation hopes to fund a minimum of three student advisors and provide on-campus resources to support our students. Thank you to those of you who have already supported this important cause. If you would like to support our efforts to provide urgent financial and mental health support to those students who need it most, you can visit the link which has been posted to the chat box in your own time. The format for this evening includes a 30 minute conversation followed by a Q&A session. We wrap up by about a quarter to eight or 8 p.m. Now do please feel free to submit questions throughout using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Your questions help us to connect and make this format more personal. So please do submit them. Ailish will get to as many as she can at the end of the conversation, but please note that she may not have time to address every question. If for whatever reason you have to leave the conversation early or have a problem with connectivity, don't worry. We are recording this session and it will be available on the UCD Alumni YouTube channel very soon. So without further ado, I will hand it over to Professor Ailish Hennessy of UCD School of Psychology, who will moderate a conversation with Dr. Sarah Fortune, Senior Lecturer in Psychological Medicine at the University of Otago, Sun Eden, and Dr. Tony Bates, founder and former CEO of Jigsaw and adjunct professor of psychology at UCD. They have very graciously joined us today. It's a great honor to have them here to discuss youth mental health and well-being in the context of COVID-19. Over to you, Ailish, and thank you. Thank you very much, Louise, and uh, good evening, everyone. As Louise said, my name is Ailish Hennessy, and I'm a professor in the UCD School of Psychology. Uh, one consequence, I think, or that I have particularly noticed uh, of uh, COVID-19 and the experience of lockdown is that mental health has been discussed much more frequently in our everyday conversations as people consider how much their lives have changed in the last six months or so and the new challenges that they're now facing. This focus on mental health is, is everywhere. It's apparent within the media and articles with headlines about mental health are now regular features of uh, daily papers in, in Ireland. Um, so, for example, I noticed one in, in June uh, run in the Irish Independent, which said just one in three of us feels we have a grip on our mental health, with the article reporting the findings of a survey which highlighted that people were struggling with things like falling asleep, feelings of anxiety or of restlessness. Uh, around the same time, uh, the journal ran a report on a survey of parents that was carried out by St. Patrick's Mental Health Services, and that study found that a quarter of parents reported that they were very concerned or extremely concerned about the impact of COVID-19 on their children's mental health. So what I think these uh, examples serve to demonstrate is that in addition to the concerns about physical health that are clearly paramount during a pandemic, we also have significant concerns about the consequences of COVID-19 for our mental health. Building a healthy world is one theme of the UCD strategy rising to the future. 
in the social sciences, one way in which our research contributes to this theme is by seeking to understand the impact of the virus and of the lockdown on our society and on us as individuals. So I'm really delighted to be joined this evening by two UCD alumni who are world leading authorities in mental health. And I hope that our conversation will bring some much needed perspective to the discussion of the impact of COVID and of lockdown on mental health and in particular on young people's mental health. So first of all, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Tony Bates. Tony was head of psychology for 30 years in St. James's Hospital, Dublin, during which time he trained with Aaron Beck in the University of Pennsylvania, and he established the MSc in Cognitive Psychotherapy in uh, Trinity. He is the founder of Jigsaw, which many of you will know is the National Center for Youth Mental Health, and which serves young people and their mental health needs. Tony, through, for many years, has been active in shaping and writing government policy, and he was appointed adjunct professor of psychology in UCD in September 2018, and I would say has been a very full and giving member of, of the community since then. He is a trained mindfulness teacher and has been disseminating mindfulness in Ireland since 2001. Tony now lives on a cliff outside Grange, north of Sligo, where he writes and consults. But Coming from even further away, um, I'm particularly grateful that we have Dr. Sarah Fortune with us this evening. Uh, Sarah is a senior lecturer in psychological medicine at the University of Dunedin in, uh, uh, sorry, the University of Otago in Dunedin, um, where it is very early in the morning. So uh, thank you, Sarah, for getting up so early for us. She has worked for more than 20 years as a clinical psychologist with children, adolescents, and their families in New Zealand, the UK, and Ireland. Sarah trained as a clinical psychologist in UCD in the 1990s, and since then her clinical experience spans both inpatient and outpatient settings. Her academic research interests include self-harm and suicide, treatment interventions, staff attitudes, and service user experiences, in addition to suicide prevention strategies. Sarah is the chairperson of the National Suicide Mortality Review Committee of New Zealand. Thank you, uh, Sarah and Tony. So to begin our conversation this evening, I, I thought it might be helpful to, to begin at the beginning, I suppose, and to clarify what exactly is meant by mental health. And, and Tony, I thought I might start with you on, on, on that one. Good evening, Sarah, Eilish, and, and uh, hello to everybody who's present. Um, we can't see you, but we know you're out there. Um, I think asking a bit about mental health is, is probably a good place to begin. And I think there's no better route to turn to than the WHO, who've actually helped us a lot understand our physical health very well recently. Um, and what they say is that good mental health is having a sense that I am somebody and that I'm growing into myself more and more with support, with encouragement, and I'm fulfilling my potential, okay? Um, so that when I say the word I, there is behind that pronoun, somebody, a sense of a person that I am in touch with. And that's important. The next thing they say is that I have a sense of life as being a place where there are troubles. I'm not surprised by disruption and stress. And I have a confidence that I can control myself and take and address the challenges I face. So it's not, you know, a, a magic bullet mental health to sort of solve the problems of the world. No, no, it's the confidence that I can meet those problems. And the final thing they say is that I have a sense, my mental health is having a sense that I have something to give uh, and that that something is valued. Uh, because I think when we do something or give something or do anything of value, we feel better about ourselves. Now, what's interesting is COVID, uh, in our discussion, we will see that COVID has kind of cut into those three things in very interesting ways. So people have suddenly been shaken up and without maybe the lifestyle they had, without livelihood, without their, you know, friends, they begin to wonder, who am I? You know, who am I actually? You know, they also begin to feel they find themselves in new territory where they're troubled and they don't have a language for it and they don't necessarily feel they can cope with it. 
So they don't have that self-agency that is important. And finally, they, they are in lockdown or isolated places where they, you know, are not sure what they can give and, and may at this stage have lost any confidence. I, some people, I, I mean, not all of us, but, you know, I think we're here to think about the vulnerable ones and that they may think they have just very little to give. Uh, so I think that's what we're addressing tonight and we're looking across different groups. But th those qualities, I think, affect every age group in different ways. <laughs> Thank you, thank you, Tony. I, I think that's a, that's a really good uh, starting point uh, for us. And I, I, you began to touch there on um, the, the the way in which COVID nineteen um, is impacting on, on on mental health. I don't know, Sarah. Maybe would you like to pick up there and have, add something to that? What you, what you see as the way in which uh, we are our mental health, and maybe particularly young people's mental health, is being challenged. Yes, well. Um, we have an interesting experience here on the uh, on the other side of the world, which is that um, we had a little bit more time um, than uh, you did in Europe in terms of we were seeing some storm clouds uh, gathering on the horizon. Um, as you know, it takes at least 24 hours to get to New Zealand. So it just gave us a wee uh, bit more uh, time, really. However, the... Um, our national government, and many of you will um, know and perhaps admire Jacinda Ardern, decided on an early uh, strategy in which she explicitly has appealed um, in her messaging and in the interventions to a sense of social cohesion. Um, there's a tagline which is used, we're a team of five million, um, and uh, went into an early and extremely comprehensive and tight uh, lockdown experience. Now, and we can talk what, what that has been like um, for some people, but the net effect actually has been, um, you know, this morning, um, because it's early, I'm talking to you from home, but I'm a, I can go into my university. Um, my children can go to school. We're looking forward to a weekend full of sports and uh, contact rugby. So we're not in the position I saw the, IF, uh, the you know, Irish Rugby Football Union is worrying whether there should be scrums or not. Well, there's scrums all over New Zealand this weekend coming, you know, coming your way. So in, in New Zealand at the moment, we actually have had fewer cases than Ireland has had total deaths. Mm. Um, so under 1,700 cases uh, and around 22 um, COVID attributable deaths. So it puts us in an interesting uh, position. Mm. It is a sort of a normal, but it's also not a normal life because our borders are essentially completely shut mm. and that is creating um, both practical economical and for some people quite significant emotional challenges in actual fact our, our hyper connectivity has been abruptly <laughs> um, uh, halted mm. and the other interesting thing in New Zealand is that in actual fact we were having a very lively and active discussion about the importance of mental health and of mental well-being for everybody in the population and we have uh, recently um, come out of a really comprehensive review of uh, mental health and addiction services, although that led to a broader conversation about population mental health. What, what, going back to Tony's you know, early definition here, what are, what are we about? What do we want for ourselves, for our communities, um, and for our, our country as a whole? So that has meant that mental health was quite high on the agenda and has remained um, quite a significant focus of the phase we find ourselves in at the moment in terms of mental health recovery. And we have, for instance, a um, COVID-19 mental health and wellbeing recovery action plan, which has already been published. And I've shared the um, link, Ailish, um, if anybody wants to see where that is. Thank you, Sarah. So, so thank you, I'm, I, Sarah. I'm conscious that you uh, talked uh, there about social cohesion and um, how very much your prime minister played up social cohesion as a way of encouraging people to be part of it. That, that seemed, Tony, somewhat similar to what you were talking about about our need for being uh, connected to, to people. Is that is is that what you how do those things link together? Yeah, I, I, first I'd just say I have read and reread that report that Sarah is alluding to protecting and protecting and promoting mental health beyond COVID-19. Is that the one, Sarah? Yes. And it's just superb. I mean, it's exciting to read. It's about 25 pages. It's very 
well written and it is such a comprehensive plan. Um, so I would, uh, I, I'm delighted to share the link and urge people to read it. You're not going to read a better mental health policy document anywhere. Um, I can say that having read quite a few, um, it's superb and uh, the languaging of it is, is, is very good. I, I think what, you know, again, what are we looking at here? We're looking at, you know, let's just say, first of all, about half the population are probably okay. They're probably fine. In all previous studies, you know, a third to a half of the population are very affected by disasters, but a half of them are okay. They're fine. Um, and now they, that doesn't mean their lives are disrupted, that they're not anxious, that they're not grief stricken, isolated, but they have psychosocial support. And that seems to be the thing that gets people through more than any other factor. A good family, friend, neighbor support, okay? Then you're left with about a quarter who we know are, a quarter to a third are very vulnerable. They, you know, we know these people, we, they've been with us for a long time. They have pre-existing conditions, they live in very difficult situations. They're caring for some relative who may be ill, unwell. Um, other working in frontline situations or in nursing homes, um, and they are exposed to, to COVID-19 sometimes in different ways. But they are very hard hit, and because they have had pre-existing conditions, they, they have relationships with services, but those relationships are inaccessible because they're either the services are closed or partially closed. And so at a moment of great stress, they just can't access support. And so we can expect among that group that they're going to uh, feel, the, the, be hard hit by COVID-19 and, and those. The other middle group, which is a sort of a, another quarter to third, we're not sure at all how many are there, but they are what that report, the New Zealand report, calls the newly at risk. These are people that have up to now managed their lives fine. You know, young people, children, um, adults, older people, but the way that they've been hit has left them really shaken. And, and they are the people who, what that report says is that in a funny way, they're not as resilient as the very disadvantaged group because the very disadvantaged group have been to hell and back many times. And they have a sense of, of what it takes to, to get through those times. This is a group, I mean, people who've lost jobs, who turn to substance addiction, who, who just um, who end up in domestic violence situations they've never been in before. And they don't have language for this. And one of the things we need to do is give people language. We've done it on the physical side, we need to do it on the sort of mental health side. And they're not mentally ill, um, but they have intense emotional reactions that can, could bring them into that territory but they, we don't, it doesn't help to think of them as suddenly mentally ill. I think they're, they're very um, distressed. And I think that they need, um, and, and, the other, and the also I think hidden for me among this group, I've been dealing with different groups and I think there's another group who are not um, very obviously upset and distressed, but they, they're kind of, they're, the literature talks about people in the months after a disaster becoming disillusioned, disengaged, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, what psychology calls languishing, you know, they just flounder. So they're kind of detached, withdrawn, they're, they, they're in a protective place, but they're not engaged with life. There's no vitality in their engagement. And, and they are kind of living lives of quiet desperation. And they never were like that. And they don't have language, they don't know how to reach out. And I think these are people we need to be mindful of, um, and they will not go to services and talk about a kind of lowered self-esteem. That's not what's going to happen. They will, they will really rely on the people around them. And I think we have to build capacity at community level to support each other, um, because it is going to be, 90% will be psychosocial, ordinary people supporting each other. You know, there'll be a small number who will need specialist care, but they, those services will be, they'll be oversubscribed because they've, they, they've been out of action for so long. And we need to make sure they come back and they reopen and they are available to the people who badly need them.
But um, there is that middle group who I think are, you know, will particularly need community. Um, Th thanks, Tony. I, I, just to remind people, you can post questions using the chat function uh, at the bottom of your of your screen. Um, but to, to, to return to the topic, I'm I'm just wondering: Is there anything, Sarah, in your uh, in that uh, mental health policy document that speaks to meeting the needs of the kinds of groups that Tony has said? I mean, uh, is that pointing to a, a way forward? Uh, yes, and I think I would reflect Tony's comments there as well, that we, I think we have to not take our eye off the ball in terms of equity for people who have had long-term struggles and have complicated uh, and really difficult lives. And I think certainly in New Zealand, we're, having, we're, we're trying to make sure that we pay attention to those long-standing and quite ingrained equity difficulties in health outcomes and not to forget about that. Because I think it's very easy to get a mental picture of... Um, someone who was a pilot for Aer Lingus and is now packing supermarket shelves in Superquin, you know, I mean, it's a, that's a very easy mental picture to form and to think about activating support for. It's sometimes a little bit more difficult to think, to create a mental picture of a, a, a family or a young person who has been chronically struggling and maybe has never been in work or hasn't been as very disconnected from education. So we have to be mindful, I think, of of those things, and particularly in media coverage, uh, the Aer Lingus pilot is probably more likely to have media space um, because it's a, a packageable story, really, um, in yeah. that fashion. Uh, certainly, so within the um, our approach here in New Zealand, we are trying to um, uh, look at all those aspects. We have, uh, you'll see again, there's a link to the Mental Health Foundation. So that is um, a really active and um, fantastic. Uh, essentially mental health promotion uh, organisation. Um, it's an NGO, although um, significantly supported by the government, and they have been producing a range of online um, and uh, hard copy um, support uh, resources for uh, parents, workplaces, schools, uh, around that idea that people, we need to support each other, people will of course turn to those most close to them in the first instance and some ideas and strategies um, about how to do that. And then we also, um, a, a colleague, um, Ailish, you know Sarah Hetrick and others have um, launched a chatbot, um, which is on the, back, on the back of their significant work in the area of e-therapy. So this is trying to address the difficulty in maintaining or supporting face-to-face -face, uh, therapeutic contact uh, in, in these uh, challenging times. And that uh, chatbot is particularly looking at uh, people struggling with anxiety or feeling overwhelmed and trying to support uh, problem solving and creating uh, you know, a range of alternative solutions uh, to their challenges. So those are a couple of things that have been going on here. Yeah, and, and Tony, have you, would you add anything to that? Anything you think we should be planning to do to um, support those people? Well, I mean, do you mean uh, young people or are kind of vulnerable so you, you people spoke, in general? about a number of groups, I suppose, um, in yeah. particular thinking about the ones who are, who are languishing or um, who, who may not have the resources necessary to uh, cope with or the, uh, and who don't have the language to go looking for support. So it, it, are there things that we can do, you think? Um, well, I, I do think we need a public mental health campaign, a, an information or research and communication, rather like the physical side. So because the physical health campaign around COVID has given us a language and the sensitivity to each other. We know where there is need. We don't know really what's happening in the country in terms of mental health. We can, we can speculate, but we're getting some information in from surveys now um, around the cares of Alzheimer's or substance abuse or different things. But you know, we need more of that information. And so that, that kind of directs our efforts. Um, I, I do want us to talk about young people in particular, but uh, you know, I. I think, yeah, I, I think we need, I would say three things. We need not, we need a language which does not overly pathologize what's happening, but recognizes that among some groups, there is a terrible uh, slippage into great pain. I mean, you know, and that, and those groups are largely known and we need to take care of them. I think 
the next thing is we need to um, sort of build capacity in communities. And I think then, uh, yeah, I mean, we need to look, we need data, you know, we need data to know what's happening. I think with young people, I think of them, there's some evidence that among children and young people, they've been in lockdown situations. All the data from China and Italy shows that it's the longer they're in lockdown and quarantine, the more severe the distress. I mean, the, that's not to say they're all distressed, but, but those who are distressed, it, it gets worse and worse the longer they're there. And so there are kind of incubation problems that will now begin to emerge and maybe be acted out in different ways. In other words, they, so, and where will they come to? They'll come to schools, they'll come back into schools, they'll come back into college. And I think teachers um, are probably going to be early witnesses to what, uh, to some of the distress young people are going through. They'll need it now, okay? Mm -hmm. And I, I think their job is not to fix it, but, but you know, they're in a unique position to, to see what's happening and to signpost or refer, maybe to an online service, it maybe to, uh, for counseling. And, and, and I think we need to support teachers in making it safe for young people to learn and, and uh, therefore giving them a sense of what they can do and what they already do very well, but also what supports are around them, you know, for those who will need that. Um, and those supports need to have some kind of a family perspective. I, I, don't, I don't think we can just pluck young people out of families. They, they've probably had very difficult times with families and there's a lot that needs to be untangled there. Um, so they at least need to keep a, a family perspective, a systemic perspective, not just treating depression and anxiety, you know, um, which will be what they present with and, and need help with. Um, and then, so, I, I mean, I feel, yeah, I, I feel Sarah perhaps has a lot to say too about young people and I was I'm kind of anticipating that you'd cover this sort of area, Sarah, but um, yeah, I, I think there's obviously scope for E um, treatments and I mean, that's for, there are wonderful stuff out there, but I don't think people and young people know about it. We need to make sure they do and they need to have their own, we need to, um, you know, encourage them to 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 connect with with their own peers um but yeah um as i say let's let's look at where the problems are likely to manifest now because they've been hidden and let's think about the people around young people and how we can support them thanks tony so one of the the questions that has come in and i think is kind of relevant to what you've been saying there is about um, young people who are fearful of returning to school or to college um, and I just wonder it, it, so I, I, I take your point Tony that teachers will be very much at the front line of that and managing it but before they get into school even they, they, they need uh, support to get there is there something parents could do I don't know Sarah have you any guidance on, on, on that or uh, can we learn anything from New Zealand uh, yeah, so we've um, been grappling with those transition, the transition back to some sort of normal life um, in the last school term. Uh, so we had a lockdown just from post, just after St. Patrick's Day um, through into May. Um, and it's, all of those things were, were as expected. We, the, the Mental Health Promotion Activity, so the Mental Health Foundation had um, publications around returning to school, around some of the things were practical um, strategies for young people, children and young people of all ages, but things like sleep. So there was a lot of sleep drift. Um, so even just working on preparedness around pulling back the, your, when you get up and when you go to bed and improving quality of sleep ahead of going uh, into school. There was um, a, a collective agreement that, and we learned this actually from the um, recovery from the Christchurch earthquakes, was that um, it's not just um, pulling people back, young people of all ages back into education and putting the hard word on them along the lines of you've missed a lot of curriculum content. Your job now is to quickly, you know, crack on and get this through. So all of the 10 week term uh, that we've just um, recently completed, the focus uh, in most educational settings was around uh, adjustment back, uh, health, well-being, readapting, and um, re-supporting structure, routine, uh, predictability, 
and focus that was really the main focus so things like for instance in my children's primary schools, school reporting has all been pushed out they're not reporting on curriculum progress to to really try and um, keep that focus on health and well-being uh, and adjustment so that has been well and we'll see the we we, we learned what not to do i think in terms of the christchurch uh, earthquake recovery that did uh, I, I think that's a, a wonderful uh, um insight you know because we i don't think we've begun that conversation i don't think we have any sense in this country that we need that conversation that going back is frightening it's stressful and what are they going back to and in many cases it's blended learning and what does that mean and what's that going to feel like and, and how do i regulate my own you know my motivation to keep up with the things and and what if i'm falling behind and and, and spending too much time online and, and just exhausted by the whole thing so you know there's a lot of behavioral hygiene that needs to be taught um but i, I don't even think we know but and again uh, my son's teacher and i don't you know think they're having those conversations in his school he's quite concerned that it's going to be very difficult but he doesn't know what to do so I think, again, when I think of psychology being relevant rather than just, you know, um, you know, hidden in some central clinic somewhere, you know, I think we need to be really hands on and, and, and supporting um, and in colleges, supporting lecturers and, and college authority. We need to be part of the conversation at a very high level about what we're bringing our young people back to. Um, uh, you know, there are guidance counsellors, of course, in the Department of Psychology and Education, and undoubtedly there are great people who are doing this already, I, I, you know, but I just think it's not the conversation I've heard in the media or at any sort of high level, um, and it would be, it's, your insights, I think, are very welcome, Sarah. I mean, you know, we have a lot to learn. And, and I, I presume as well that the, I suppose, the concerns and the challenges that will be faced will vary very much depending on the age group that we're talking about. So going back to primary school is different from going back as a 16 year old and is different again if you're starting college for the first time. Yes, they are, Ailish, although we've, and, uh, we have had a surge in demand for national helplines of pretty much every description and we're about We've been lucky to get some funding uh, just recently to look at that pattern of demand and then also the innovative clinical responses around uh, telehealth and all sorts of other things with, that people have been you know, trying to cobble together uh, solutions about how to, how to respond effectively to this increased demand. But the, the things that young people of all ages are raising are anxiety and worry. They are the sense of disruption about, it, and this is for all of us, the, uh, the, the things, the heuristics or the, the shortcuts of assumptions we have had in the world about how the world works have actually, in many cases, been profoundly challenged. And we really, uh, you know, it's not at all certain what those are going to look like in the, in the future. And then increasingly young, especially young adolescents, um, expressing worry and concern about job loss in homes, about the impact on food stability, uh, and about the impact on housing. And again, as we've progressed, um, young people expressing worries about how their parents or caregivers are coping. Um, and I, so I think as parents and caregivers, that gives us also a little bit of a clue, which is we want to support our, our families and um, be transparent with our kids that we're looking after, but we don't want them to be at the holders of our worry or the holders of our uncertainty we need to um, think about getting our, you know, adult to adult uh, support needs uh, met so that our kids don't feel uh, unduly burdened um, about that. The other challenges, and I, and I think that, you know, we've done some really um, fantastic things, but I think also in terms of uh, this challenge around equity, we know, for instance, that, and in, particularly in some of our um, poorer communities here in New Zealand, that there are up to 25% of students have not yet come back to school. The question is, where are they? And that, that's an important question. And um, we know, for instance, I'm talking with colleagues and some uh, older students, so be, they'd be heading towards their final exams in, in Irish terms. They're 17, 18 years of age. And in some of those um, communities, those young people are not coming back to school because they were able to pick up a job in the um, 
the supermarket, uh, you know, warehouse distribution centre, for instance, you know, filling orders for online shopping, and they are not great jobs. They're zero hour contracts. They're paid at youth rates, but they've now found themselves being the only people in their home who actually have a job. Mm. And so education has gone from being um, a great thing to have to being a luxury that the family can't afford right now. Mm. Um, and so these are the emerging issues that we're um, starting to think about. How, what, how can we best respond uh, to support the needs of those young people and their families? Mm. I think the first thing we need to do is to listen to them. And I, I suspect we don't know how young people, we know that we're parents are delighted people, young people are going back to school um, for all kinds of reasons. Um, but we don't really know how young people feel about that. And maybe, you know, 60% of them feel fine. It's, it's just, it's great. Um, but, you know, maybe there are those who are in the, in those trickier positions and, I'm not sure we've listened to them. Um, there are those who, as you say, are disinclined to come back to school because they have other priorities now they never had before. And, they, and they've been in a family where, like it or not, they feel every nuance of the parents' pain and tension and frustration if they've had financial worries or they've lost jobs. So they're, they're carrying a lot of that. And I think that's just how it is. It's very hard to imagine how parents could you know, entirely keep that away from them because they're living together, you know, or even if they're not living together, they're picking it up, I would say, but many of them are living in the, in the shadow of this tragedy. So I, I just, I feel one of the things we need to do is just stop being worried about, um, just, just worried about physical safety at schools, but actually think about what, what young people feel about coming back and what supports they need and what supports parents may need um, and teachers may need. Um, and again, I, I just think I haven't heard anybody articulate this, this conversation. So maybe it's just me, but I'm just saying I'm very grateful that you've named it, Sarah. And I hope we can, I hope we can do something, you know, that begins to make, wake up to what's likely to happen. You know, we all think it'd be great, they'll all be back at school, it'll be fine. What if 25%, which is, you know, 20,000 or, you know, what if they don't go back? You know, oh, well then we scratch our heads and wonder, we never saw that coming. It's, it's, it's terrifying. I mean, you know, for every, everybody concerned. Um, so yeah, I, I hope we do something about that. As a result of this. What do you think we should be doing? Is it, do you have a, a suggestion? Well, it would be great if we had a university at that, where there were researchers and they could actually really go and, and ask these questions of young people. But yeah. you probably don't have a department of psychology or a department of education because they'd be helpful. I, I, they're the people I'd look to because suddenly there's an opportunity to do really relevant research, you know, because it needs to be well done. and, and um, uh, but it also needs to be done fairly rapidly. So maybe it's not perfect. It's not of the, 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 the stature of some of the research you guys have produced, and it's super. Um, but maybe it's more survey data, but it's, 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 it's you know, you know it's, it's well designed and, and it, 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 it has a large N. And, uh, you know, so I, I just think that would be a place to start. Um, mm -hmm. So we think about, before we can react, we need to understand what's happening. We need to listen to the young people. Yeah, we need to know. Yeah, until you can name it, you can't really respond. It's just all very theoretical, you know. Um, young people need support. They need self-esteem. They need to be listened to and valued. We need to encourage them. We need to hear their concerns and take those seriously. And we need to also contain them so they don't. We don't all get completely lost in worry about the future. Um, somebody needs to, to steer the ship, and as parents and adults, I think we're, we're meant to be doing that. We're, we're the containers for a lot of, of, of their experience. Um, so we need to be good containers. And um, so that they're all general things, but I, I think what Sarah's talking about are very specific uh, challenges that uh, are, we're about to face, and I don't think we're ready. Um, and it would be 
important to to I, I would start with 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 some kind of you know listening exercise which was um, targeted at, at young people in different stratas of society or in different age groups I don't know but I, I this would take some thought and I'm not there okay thanks yeah. thanks Tony I thought maybe I'd just touch on one other uh, theme um, because it's coming up in, in quite a few questions which is what we can do um, for the many people that are seen as who, who won't reach out for help so th there are different examples given in in, in various uh, different questions that, that, that I'm seeing coming up but basically are there strategies we can use to reach out to the groups who may not themselves recognize that their, their, their need for help I don't know Sarah would you have anything you could say on that well I think sometimes it's um, I mean obviously we need a range of interventions from the individual good quick access to high quality psychological therapy all the way up to a whole of population approach and sometimes we don't necessarily think of some of those things that happen for everybody in the population is actually have been quite powerful mental health interventions. But for instance, I mean, when, when one of the concerns about um, the COVID, um, the, the tail of this is of course, um, particularly economic downturns and unemployment. And we have, it's one of the most robust uh, total population predictors of mental distress is unemployment. We, and it's particularly for young people. And we know that, and Ireland unfortunately knows particularly well um, what that feels like and what that looks like and what that is like for young people in particular. When I came to Ireland in the 1990s, um, I was the only one of my extensive cousins who was actually in the country in the mid 1990s. Mm -hmm. Everybody else was someplace else where there was work. And um, you know there were in many family homes still, um, you know, alive and, and thriving. But the men folk, of course, were in the UK or in emerging Russian states or in the US. So, you know, we've in Ireland we've lived through this before. We know what that looks like. We know that um, education is one way of leveraging um, a pathway and some clarity for young people. And and probably that from a population point, um, mental health point of view supporting education of all sorts and third level education is a good uh, thing to do. So in New Zealand, there's just been a, a big um, wedge of money has been put into primary industry training um, in the equivalent of the polytech uh, sector um, to give pathways for school leavers at various points uh, in terms of on, uh, you know, onward training. Uh, and the other thing we know is, yes, keeping um, incomes in families, keeping incomes in the pockets of mums and dads and families or people who are caring for the next generation uh, is also important. And in New Zealand has um, had a fairly proactive strategy in that area in terms of uh, rapid and relatively generous um, uh, payments uh, scheme um, that has been uh, administered. Although we are concerned because that's about to end on the 1st of September. So we're imagining that it hasn't, of course, prevented, there's still a number of people who have lost their livelihoods, have lost their work, uh, mm -hmm. but there are another group who have been held uh, for a period of time. But we, you know, have some, we have an election coming and uh, we have um, not, like all, the, the kitty is not bottomless. So we'll have to think about um, what goes forward. But we know that those sorts of interventions actually are good for all of us in terms of mental health and well-being. I think in Ireland, uh, you know, uh, I mean, I, in terms of that question, how do we reach people who, who are not reaching out to us, you know, mm -hmm. um, and, I, and this is putting my neck on the line, but I think we're actually quite a compassionate country mm -hmm. and we have, we need to recognise the compassion in our communities already. Um, you hear it in the airwaves and I, I do think that our national radios have done a superb job at listening and picking up some of the hidden distress that's out there and responding. Um, and in many ways, they're, they're doing what a lot of us professionals need to be doing. Um, listening, naming, and reaching, reaching into those people. And I think we have so many charity and voluntary groups in community who are doing excellent work, you know, from men's sheds to you know, Vincent de Paul, to, but there are lots of, it's to recognise what's happening already and just coordinate it maybe or just, 
lift it up, you know, but, it, 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 you know, again, I'd ask those people how, you know, what they want to be saying to people who are not reaching out. And I think there are lots of, you know, there are lots of different ways to communicate uh, via media and via um, local groups. But probably what we have to do is, is what our new mental health policy calls assertive outreach. We need to we need not to be waiting, but to be proactive. We need to look in on people. We need to be thoughtful. We need to be, you know, and we need to know that it's those low intensity supports from the shopkeeper, from the cleaners, from the, you know, it's those supports that can change somebody's life, you know, in a day. It just, it, it, we need lots of that. So we need to, I think we just need to name and encourage what is already working out there, I suspect, okay. um, rather than create a whole new, you know, um, and it, yeah, we can, we can be better at it, but I think there's a lot of it already going on, I suspect. Okay, thank you. So I'm, 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 I'm conscious that we are um, drawing to the end of our time. I don't know, would either of you like to add any kind of final thoughts to our conversation uh, be, before uh, I hand you back to Louise? I just had one comment, and I see just had flicked through in the chat there as well, which is around um, how we interact with media and the message, the narrative that's in the media, particularly around mental health. So I think that on one hand, it's fantastic that we're having a conversation about mental health, that that's got a strong and important um, destigmatizing effect. Mental health is not a thing that's happening away there, away from us to other people. It's actually part of our conversation as a community. So I think that that is helpful and productive. But I um, think that in most of our countries, there is, um, a fairly significant um, and fairly repeated media narrative, which is this is a catastrophic event which will have dire impact on our mental health and our well-being. Um, that uh, this is causing, um, yeah, a tsunami of um, psychological distress at the most severe mm -hmm. end. And I think that we need to push back against that because I think that um, we can measure that in lots of different ways, but. In Ireland and in New Zealand, actually, we're not seeing a tsunami. We are seeing some people who are struggling, but that we need to be, um, because I think that can give the message that de-skills people, that says yeah. this, everybody is doing poorly, we're all, it's yeah. all going terribly, um, it's all going to end incredibly badly, is um, quite disempowering and, mm. um, and potentially quite inaccurate. Yeah. yeah, I mean, the, the, the evidence we have is that, you know, a third to a half we, we, we are hit badly. About 75% of those do fine in the long term. Most of them recover in the first couple of months. And then there are some of those you know, people whose lives can be changed by, by these experiences. But I, I did quite a review recently of the papers and... It, it is a, the, the language, I would say we need a discipline about language because the language at times um, is disciplined and talks about the prevalence rate of certain symptoms. That's fine. Quite difficult saying the 60% increase of major depression, 40% increase in eating disorders, you know, which equates sort of distressing symptoms to major psychiatric disorders. It elevates, I think that's a very very unhelpful kind of thing to do and and uh, not only does it alarm people and um, but it also undermines as you say these skills the mm -hmm. the ordinary ways that we cope with ups and downs and and with trauma in our lives mm -hmm. and grief i mean we, we you know um it's a massive study on grief in ireland and, and, and how people cope with intense griefs and 90 percent found they did fine with their own friends, family, and neighbors. They did not find the psychiatric or psychological help particularly relevant or helpful. Mm -hmm. um, so they, you know, they. So I think we need to say go back to some basics. Um, yeah, I had some final thing I know I wanted to say, which is going to make sense of everything. Um, but uh, it's. <laughs> um, I, I, you know, I, I, I just think, yeah, we need to. We, we need not to, to patronize people. We need to hear them and 
really listen to the pain that's out there, but we, we, we need to believe in people too. And oh yeah, I know the last thing. I was going to end with the comment that's at the very end of that report is really good. It says, um, we've talked about these things endlessly for years, all these psychosocial support and treatment, and, you know, and counseling and therapy. We, everybody knows, you know, it's like the Leonard Cohen song, everybody knows, but it's not always happening. Now, what they said was, you know, in, uh, in co what one thing COVID has done is, is it's socially and economically, it has been a catalyst for the most unthinkable changes. I mean, we are, you know, we overnight become a socialist country of sorts, you know. Um, and we never thought that was possible. Um, Bernie Saunders told us all we should go that way and we thought he was a complete idiot. Now we're doing it. Now, and the thing is, in the same way, you know, this is, and everything in World Health Organization says, this is a time for mental health reform. This is when we can get it right. And, and COVID maybe is the, the catalyst we need to start talking about mental health and well-being in a different way and to really put it out there as to how we manage um, our own mental health and how we, so we do feel somebody, we do feel like we have agency, we do feel we have something to give. Uh, I think this could be a time, this could be a milestone in the conversation, which is, you know, that, that's that's a very uh, positive note um, on, on on which uh, to end. And I just, Tony and, and Sarah, thank you both so much for for giving up your time this evening. And I'm going to hand uh, back over now to Louise. Uh, thank, thank you, Edith. So, look, a fantastic conversation and a great insight to a very important subject. Um, a big thank you from all of us in UCD Alumni Relations to Professor Ada Tennessee, of course, Dr. Sarah Fortune and Dr. Tony Bates. It was really lovely to meet you and thank you for sharing your time with us. And to everybody who has participated, thank you all for attending and uh, tuning in and sharing your questions with us. Again, we would really appreciate your support by donating to the link which is in your chat box. This has been a very difficult time for many people but your response and solidarity in adversity is a powerful and inspiring force for good as we address youth mental health and well-being in a crisis. So, look, thank you. And I'd just like to highlight our next UCD What It Takes webinar is at 1 p.m. on Wednesday, August the 5th. And the title is What It Takes to Manage Boundaries When Working at Home. And then we will have our next um, UCD and Conversation series on the 13th of August, and we are very excited to have Simon O'Connor, Director of Molly, join us and take us through some of the exciting exhibitions and programmes planned for the Museum of Literature in Ireland. So have a great long weekend, everyone. Thank you for tuning in to our amazing panellists. Very grateful to you all. And please stay safe and well and have a good night. Thank you. Thank you, Louise. Thank you so much. Thank you, Louise. Pleasure and honour. Thank you. Bye, everyone.